Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you, not at all live, from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. All right, well, welcome to uh, everybody who's joining us for episode two of Tales of the Sail, um, which is the team that Mitch so generously gave us instead of whatever unwieldy thing I had. Uh, this is uh, Tom Chairborn Mullane coming to you from the No Dice, No Glory Bunker. And I am joined today by um, famous uh, Dutch personality, pirate, saver of goats and baker of pies, Glenn Van Meter. Hello, everybody. And we are joined today by another series regular who's going to be with us for the hall on all things Firelock. And that's going to be Tyler Stone. How's everybody doing? Tyler Stone is a man who wears a pirate hat better than anyone. And if you've seen him at the recent conventions, you've probably seen him running games that require an enormous amount of miniatures that, well, we're all thankful that Tyler has, because Lord knows I can't paint that fast. Um, so we, we have a lot to talk about this time, don't we, guys? Um, but I'm going to start off by just introducing people to, to Mr. Stone, to Tyler, let him tell about his gamer bona fides. And he's been playing Blood and Plunder for longer than me and Glenn, so I feel like he's more the expert. And I'm just going to treat Tyler like a human rule book and historian and just ask him a lot of questions. So um, how would you get into the game? And uh, you know, what stuff do you play? Give us an idea. So I got into the game because I'd been playing Warhammer Fantasy since I was a little kid. And whenever that game kind of went where it's gone to now, uh, I was looking for something else to play, and I kind of ran into Blood and Plunder, and it was right up my alley being a pirate game. So I jumped onto that pretty quickly. <laughs> did you join at the Kickstarter, or did you, like, who taught you how to play? I joined, I joined in time for the second Kickstarter. Um, I picked up uh, an English Force the Christmas right before, and anything that I learned to play was through the YouTube videos that they put out. Um, I went through the rule book pretty much on my own and went from that straight into running demos and playing locally with friends and stuff. Um, and you've been busy like over the past year, right? Cause you're, you're part of the quartermaster program too. So like what, what sort of area are you operating? Where are you, where are you teaching people to play? So I'm in uh, central and South central, like right there on the Maryland border, um, Lancaster, York, area uh, i travel a lot to play i'm used to driving about an hour to get to a game store <laughs> that sounds that sounds familiar yeah i and, think uh, that's pretty common and let me ask you this question with some some fear in my voice what armies do you have for blood and plunder so one of the great things about being a quartermaster is you're really encouraged to have all of them so i have I've got all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm as terrified of that as you were to ask me because it means I got to paint all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so you, have, you have a ton of stuff that's already painted, though. Um, and like, later on, uh, we want you to give people an idea of some of the scenarios and stuff that you guys have done um, because you, you worked in a really pretty cool historical scenario at, uh, at Fallen. I did, yeah. All right, so we're going to kind of go around the, the horn and tell people what we've been up to. Um, so as we're recording this, it is uh, it's, it's mid-December. Um, there's plenty of time to buy, to buy more stuff. Um, there's plenty of time yeah. to put things on your Christmas list. And um, as we get to the end of the year, we're kind of, you know, making, um, making resolutions. I definitely want to do like New Year's resolutions with you guys in January because I always find those hilarious on podcasts because then we can record them and bust them out if we're still going in a year and then make fun of each other for either achieving or not achieving them. Um, so I have been painting. Um, I have gotten done another unit of Zealanders with the striped pants. And I got to run a demo event up at Kerwan's game store in Catskill. 
I taught Chris Johnson how to play. I taught Rich Mitra how to play. Um, and those are two guys that, that tend to hook a lot of other people on the game. And they really, they had a great time. They liked it. Um, and I had all my, my full table of terrain with all the desert stuff and all of my great fish tank uh, doodads. Um, I, Chris, so Chris Johnson is one of the nicest people in the world. And he's also a brilliant player of these games. And he's actually the guy that I originally taught Flames of War to up at that club. And um, he then proceeded to just destroy me at that game forever. I don't think I've ever won a game of Flames of War against Chris Johnson after the demo where I taught him how to play. It's sort of like an Obi-Wan Kenobi Darth Vader vibe. And, you know, I just keep getting cut down because I'm Obi-Wan. Uh, and I think this is going to be the same thing. I suspect that Chris is going to build some amazing force. I don't know what it is. And he's going to just descend out of the jungle and and wreck me. Uh, but it's always fun seeing what he comes up with. And I always learn something playing with him. And I always have a good time. So in the end, I'm sure it'll be fun. So I'm going to keep going up there and playing at uh, Kerwin's and see if I can get a couple people up there to play. And I'm also going to see if I can get Gamers Gambit down here in Danbury, Connecticut to start carrying this because I think it's pretty easy for stores to keep this kind of stock on their shelves because they make the game so manageable in terms of model count that, you know, you can get a few and have a great time playing, or you can go the Tyler Stone direction. <laughs> you can get literally everything. Um, so, so Glenn, tell us what you've been painting and building. Well, uh, unfortunately I've, I got a little behind on the painting schedule because I was running a Toys for Tots event this past weekend for by Fire and Sword, and I was spending all week trying to get a musket or pike and shot regiment painted up for that. Um, however, I have been working on my Dutch. There's a bit more progress since Fall In. Um, I took them in a painted state. They weren't complete, uh, and I'm trying to get them finished up. Uh, I've also used Black Friday as an excellent chance to stock up on terrain. So this December is terrain ships and painting month at the Van Meter house or farm. Uh, is, this, so, is this like a family event? Your, your like terrain building? Uh, yeah, actually I, my wife is actually interested in helping me because she thinks of it as arts and crafts at that point. Uh, oh, you so, lucky dog. Well, we broke out the hot glue gun and we've uh, glued some aquarium plants to circular or oval bases, and I'm using Vallejo sand pumice to do desert, and then boom, that's pretty done easy. Uh, I've got some palm trees that are going to require a bit more work. Um, but like I said, Black Friday, I used the opportunity with the 20% discount from Firelock to, for the Black Friday sale to get a couple of houses. Um, I've also gotten recently a couple of fat mats for the Caribbean stuff. So we've got the shoreline and the the uh, land based on the excellent article that Tyler wrote for NDNG. Well, thank you. And <laughs> no problem. I'm looking at the Caribbean uh, Caribbean water one too, but that's a uh, that's a future purchase for sure. And then I, also I actually, got a lot of... yeah, I have I have it's on my Christmas list, like number one. I want one of those mats that has the Caribbean water look to it. I want that. Oh, yeah. The 6x4 one I think I'm looking at just because uh, I know I've got some big ship battles ahead of me. Um, I also ordered some terrain and crates from a company called Micro Art Studios over in Poland. I'm waiting for those to arrive so I can get, so get them painted up. Uh, but they had a lot of piles of crates and stuff where it's like fishing dock look or... Um, apples and other fruits, some things like that. So it should make excellent scatter terrain for a Caribbean village. Um, like I said, I'm just trying to get the terrain game completely down so that I can put a couple of tables out uh, for demos. Um, Another place that I would give a plug to because um, they were super nice is, I don't know if you guys have checked out Iron Gate Scenery. Have you checked them out or not, or no? Sounds familiar. Stuff around. Um, I know they do. They do a good, a good selection of scatter terrain, don't they? Yeah. So that that's what I wound up getting, and the kit that I used to demo the game is basically all Iron Gate scenery and some stuff that I handmade 
along the lines of what Glenn put together. Um, so it's like barrels. They have if you're building a market, they have this enormous like like line of different markets. Like they have a little a fishmonger, they have a butcher, um, they have a bread maker, they have a spice merchant, and I got all of that stuff for like thirty bucks. I, I got five stalls with all the little doodads and scattered terrain, plus a wagon, um, and two wagons actually, and barrels and crates and boxes, like enough to cover an entire three by three table with some doing, to spare. They're doing the whole oh. line for um, Gangs of Rome, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. That's that's been awesome. Like any of the Napoleonic Peninsular stuff, or like a lot of the old Latin buildings like the roman buildings they're all pan tile they work really well for the caribbean like any of the spanish settlements or english yeah, they're great um spanish. yeah the stuff goes together well it painted up nice and um the only weird thing i experienced is because they're from the uk for some reason the the post office kept wanting me to sign for it mm-hmm. and i know i know my post guy so like after the first two failed deliveries i like you know it's okay it's 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 thirty dollars worth of adorable, well sculpted plastic barrels. Like, if some porch pirate steals it off my porch, then they're welcome to keep it. But I don't know. Like, I imagine them getting home and expecting some like really valuable thing, and then opening it up and being like, you know, it's not at this? all the this iPhone is, I thought you ordered. It's not the iPhone I expected to steal. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how that was gonna go. So I um, did. I did look at these guys before. I just went to their website, and I'm I I remember looking at them and thinking I want some of these small rowboats just because you know they're very tiny. They're a lot smaller than the long uh, long boats that we use for by fire or blood and plunder. But they've also got like the flotsam, like the floating bits, some shark fins, a bunch of stuff to add a lot of character. And I feel like the the tables for this game can look so cool that it's just it's eye popping at a convention. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's cool. It's, it's fun building terrain for this because it's just so it's, it's unique and it always looks cool and there's a lot okay. of different ways to do it. They have a torture section, including, um, a couple of those, uh, cages you <laughs> often see. Oh, the, the, the gibbets. I'm yeah, just, the, I'm just uh, gibbets I'm laughing. Stuff. Cause like that, that's like our out of context quote of the day. You sounded so excited. <laughs> you said, guys, there's a torture section. Hey man, it's boring here on the farm sometimes. <laughs> I should be more worried about where my food comes from. <laughs> oh no, we um, take good care of the animals. Vibes are too much. <laughs> so so glad. So you've been painting, you've been terrain building, um, and have you been doing demos for people in the area? I have done some demos at games and stuff, mostly within the gaming club I'm already in because people are increasingly asking about it. You know, they see people playing this game and they go what is that it looks interesting i noticed you managed to play three games in an evening uh you know i won in on that so we've had a couple of guys approach me i've set up demos i have another one set up um in about a week and a half when i get back from a quick trip to florida um but yeah we've got a couple more guys starting at games and stuff games and stuff so i think we've got about a dozen people playing there and I have been in contact with another store in the area as well, uh, which we'll get to that when the upcoming events section comes in. Cool. Uh, and Tyler, um, our elder statesman and um, man full of sagely wisdom, why don't you give us an idea what you've been up to? Um, so I really wanted to take a break after painting all of the stuff that I did for Fallen, but the Facebook community, the fan group that Blood and Plunder has, which is just a crazy long name. It's like blood and plunder buccaneering across the Spanish main every year. So far they've been doing a secret Santa for people on that Facebook group. So I painted up um, just four miniatures. I don't want to say who they're going to because they're probably not going to hit that person's doorstep until Saturday. Um, But I immediately knocked those out and I've been working on that. And after that, I think I'm going to lean in. I've got a little bit more I want to do for my personal table uh, for Blood and Plunder, but then I also want to put together um, kind of in anticipation for the Blood and Valor, the World War I game that they're doing. Uh, 
I want to frame up a demo board, something maybe like two by two and have that ready so that I can easily transport that with me as soon as that drops and is out on general release and I can start demoing that for people. So that's mostly what I've been working on. And then there's just the, I mean, like you said, I have a pile of lead and several ships. So I've been kind of working my way through those as I have the energy to do it. So I have a, sh I have a ship question for you. Okay. All right. So, so you have listed here in our notes to each other, ship rigging experiments. Um, yeah. So like they don't include, so the ships are, are beautiful sculpts. Um, and they come with some of the accoutrements of shipping. So they have little, uh, you know, cannons and things like that. But there's other bits and bots you can get, like anchors and things that they sell. Um, I, I found a guy online that makes sails, and he designs them specific to each of the ships. And I, I ordered through him, um, and it came right away. That the, They look great. But the rigging, like how... What what sort of things have you done with the rigging and what have you found works works really well? So this is something that I want to do. I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words, but I want to do in the future as one of the articles on No Dice. And I've been trying to figure out, hence the rigging experiments, I've been trying to figure out to what level of detail I want to do this. Uh, going to fall in, I can say that the elastic line that they send with the ships to rig them and the like the very simple kind of laser cut wood rigging components that they have. Um, they work really well. You can pick up the masts and lay them flat and not have to worry about like just taking models in half. <laughs> um, but I also have kind of lurking in my basement right now, a Tartana that I rigged up um, kind of incidentally, I think Mike, Tunia said that we were looking probably at the same model boat that they designed the Tartana model off of. Um, but I did full rigging on that. So I bought the small, very finicky wood blocks and scale model rope and things that the ship modelers would use. The guys that build ships in a bottle or music. Yeah. Um, the price on that can be shocking. <laughs> um, I I don't know that I would necessarily try to make them myself, but there are certainly tutorials for doing that. Uh, the issue is you have to strike a balance between, I mean, first of all, it's all going to be solid rigging. I don't think you're going to be able to find some kind of a compromise to still lay the mast flat. But you also have to strike a balance between how much stuff you have on deck that is not miniatures. Because trying to get, I mean, I have, I'm fortunate, I have very small hands, but like some of the people that I've played games with are very large, like King Kong hands, and they can't reach in to get the miniatures around the amount of rigging that, I mean, historically would be on one of these ships, but also in game terms, you don't want all that in the way. I've seen some of the like really high quality mini ships that people. So there's like this, I forget what the name of the museum is now, but um, so I, I'm writing an article for this. It's kind of related because it's naval history um, about my family's history in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, they were on a destroyer and it went down and I had the occasion to be at this, uh, an event in, in Georgia, in Savannah. And there's like a museum of naval history that's like all miniature ships. Um, and it's like just, this, it's a converted mansion that's just two floors of these beautifully crafted models from all different eras. But the most impressive ones are the ones from this era, like, you know, colonial history mm -hmm. in the Caribbean where you have all this elaborate, um, you know, grid work and stuff like that it's just it's absolutely beautiful i took tons of pictures um i'm gonna post a bunch of them because i uh, it's, it's just so cool uh but yeah i can i can see the, the struggle <laughs> because if, if you're trying to make it look realistic you're never going to be able to break those things down um, some of them i think that you 
yeah, you won't be able to break them down. Some of them I think you'd be able to reach into. Um, rigging up the Tartana, the issue with that is it's Latine rigged, and it's just that rigging layout, the schematic for that is so crazy because it doesn't work at all like a normal mast and yards would work. I've never actually gone sailing on like a sailing ship. Like the only ship I've been on is like a cruise ship where the goal is to, you know, get as fat as possible in a short period of time. And like, you get yelled at if you try to bust your plates, they're like angry with you and you're like, (laughs) calm down, man. Um, But it's something I always wanted to learn how to do. Uh, And I know the basic principles of it, but I feel like I'd probably decapitate myself as like, you know, one of the masts is swinging back and forth. (laughs) There are courses at all kinds of places that if you're ever interested in doing that, I'm sure you're about a Google search away from finding somewhere to go and learn a little bit of yacht sailing. <laughs> I also feel like I, I don't know, my association with sailing has never been the fun colonial buccaneer association. It's always been the uh, like 80s camp movie where, you know, the poor camp and the rich camp. You know, um, and I feel like yeah. all the rich kids have like you know their yacht the shoes on. And, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm not wealthy enough to to qualify as somebody who would be skilled at sailing. I feel like it's that's a rich man's game, Tyler. It's a rich it's, man's game. It is, and it's not a game for me. I don't have that kind of money either. <laughs> um, so I'll mention two things before we we jump into kind of the main crux of the episode, and that would be. Um, so we talked to Mitch. Mitch gave us some notes because, you know, Mitch is far smarter than me. Um, and he said that we tend to jump around a lot. Uh, that's obviously my fault, as people can kind of hear, because I like I get excited and I just want to talk about random things. Um, but Mitch is also more organized because he spent his life, um, you know, working as a logistics person for the Air Force. And I feel like you have to be organized. And I'm a teacher, so I should be but I'm not. Um, so we will try to focus more on single topics as opposed to jumping around as we kind of get in the rhythm of this. Um, but in that inspirational vein, you ran a game at Fallen that was enormous. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about um, what the game was, what the history was, the models you used, things like that? Um, yeah, I can do that. I need to pull, since we're going to stay on topic. Uh, so... I ran the battle at Perico Bay, which um, historically it was fought on St. George's Day, like all great British naval engagements. Um, Of course, of course. So April 23rd, 1680, and it was about 68 pirates against, by their account, so I'm sure that they may have inflated this number somewhat, uh, 228 Spanish sailors of varying quality Um, but it was more impressive is that the spanish came out in galleots which are small kind of rowable ships um i used brigantines for the game because that was the only way i was going to be able to get enough models on deck to get even close to the 228 um so it was it was you know large sailable ships with cannons against these 68 pirates in canoes and essentially uh, native war canoes, the Paragua. So that was the game that I put on, and I had uh, about... How many, how many canoas did you have on that table? I had, I had eight canoas and two Paraguas on the table. Okay, go ahead, Tyler, keep going. All right, so I had the eight canoas, two Paraguas, and about 150 miniatures on the table for that game. Yeah, and you had a lot of people come in and take a look at this. I Including had, me. I, I had a uh, couple of spectators as players. Now, Glenn, did, were you playing the game? No, unfortunately, uh, that was during the same time I was playing a tournament for by Fire and Sword, but I did keep wandering over because Max, Eric, and Ben were playing. Uh, and I wanted to see if they got all their canoas overturned or not. <laughs> yeah, didn't they try to ram? I think somebody tried to ram the canoas at one point, And they almost did like a cartoon style, you know, slamming them around. Yeah, there were moments that we we actually pulled Mike over <laughs> because I don't think that they ever 
intended to see that many Kanoas and boats on the table in one go. And things got a little bit weird with having, um, I mean, almost like 28 days later, just being dragged down by zombies. It would be one ship just dragging like half a dozen Kanoas along with it, trying to get over to where the Spanish could help each other out. And at one point, it is kind of crazy that you had, um, <laughs> did you have like the creator of the game like nearby being like, yeah, I wait, it was what's the role? And sometimes <laughs> there, there was a moment they turned a ship and it swung several of the attached canoes through other canoes that were attached to other ships. And I was just like, so how do we work the ramming out? And the amount of damage that's going to be caused from these things, like going like dominoes across the table. Well, I feel like generally, you know, scenarios like the one you have would probably play out really well with like, uh, you know, Oak and Iron. Because you're talking about more ships. I mean, yours is still a small unit action and it made sense to use it at the scale you did. It looks so, so cool. But I feel like if you want to try out some of these major historical naval engagements from the 1600s, 1700s, you know. I, I'd also be interested to see you kind of combining the two of them, where you have like one game affecting the other. Um, right. The, the issue with Perico is the canoes. You would have to come up with some way of representing, and maybe you would do like two or three canoes on one base. Um, or, or it's like uh, the, the fighter squadrons from Starfleet Armada. Yeah, something along those lines. But bigger battles like Texel and things like that with, you know, a hundred ships on each side for the Anglo-Dutch wars. You're going to need to put something that is you can't play that with Blood and Blunder. (laughs) No, that's fair. And I think that that's ultimately what Oak and Iron is intended for. The larger fleet actions that you you really you just don't see them with privateering um, in the period that we're talking about. There's very few and far between. I mean, wasn't there only like one or two pirates ever that had a fleet? And I'm using quotes here of like three ships. Like for the most part, it was not that big, right? It would get together in decent sized groups of ships, um, but it would be like a coalition of people coming together. And I'm talking about like an individual commander. Like, was it Morgan? Was he the one I'm thinking of that had three? Morgan had several. because he packed up and delivered a couple thousand pirates, you know, like ready made to Panama. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the I feel like is- I feel like uh, collaboration really isn't the strong suit for pirates. Like you, you didn't go into piracy because you're like, I really want to have this collaborative meeting. We're gonna come to a consensus on this, guys. Oh, can you imagine the team building meetings? Ugh. I feel like there'd be a lot of plank walking, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Trust falls right it. in the ocean. I can't remember if it was. It might have been DeGraff, but I always kind of associate any cool pirate stories with him because he was just awesome. He's probably my favorite character in the game. But they were all, they had several captains working together to come up with what their invasion strategy was going to be or how they were going to pull off this giant heist. And the ship that they were on, somebody had a huge safety slip up and just blew the ship to pieces like when you hear about the powder magazine going up so before they even really left port to go on this raid their team building exercise was trying not to drown in the Caribbean <laughs> <laughs> and their ship suddenly turned into a fire you know, I think I think my favorite story historically from this time period roughly of like mishaps that cost an enormous amount of money um so like during the French and Indian War, the British basically resolved that the best way to win the war was to cover it in money, you know, just like make it rain in North America. And one of the things that they did was they built a fort up at Crown Point, you know, so it's this north of Ticonderoga. And they spent roughly a, a, a million um, British pounds building this, a million and a half building this one fort because it, it took forever to bring all the materials in to build it. And this is the equivalent of like a billion dollars in today's money. Uh, and they, they built this thing. And when the war's over, you know, the fort really isn't useful anymore because it's not really defending against anything. The British have Canada and they have the United States. So the fort's kind of a waste. So they, but they still need to staff it with people. So there's a couple people that are there 
just to kind of justify its existence because you can't just build something for a billion dollars and then you know flush it in the toilet. And a woman's apparently doing the laundry, and the fire in the laundry room gets out of control, and it ignites the powder magazine, and it blows the fort up. So, so like, I can't think of another time when somebody is like, oh, well, I left the dryer on, and it blew up a billion and a half dollars with the military hardware. Like, I just, it's unreal. And it, it so left like next- a, yeah, it's like a crater. You can go my visit next, it today. My next question is, who does laundry next to the powder magazine? Your clothes are going to smell like sulfur. You're going to spend your day smelling like bad eggs. <laughs> I don't think it was right next to it. It's just that the fire, fire started and it spread. <laughs> and it just, it, and no, nobody fixed it either. But like, the crazy thing is these people, it's like when the, when the revolution starts, everybody still has this image in their head of what these forts are like. And that image is from like 20 years before. And they don't realize that these forts have been the subject of laundry fire disasters, <laughs> disuse. So like Ben Franklin and a crew go up to Canada to like, you know, feel them out, see if they're interested in joining the rebellion. And on the trip up, which takes like a month and a half, because there's no, you know, there's no I-87. Um, they, they encounter all these like craters of forts that look like complete holes. And they're like, wow, this is, these, these are some hot garbage. But um, yeah, it's, I think we take for granted just how difficult life was and how often mistakes like this could be made. Cause I feel like we assume a level of competence in our leaders, especially pirates. And uh, I don't know, sometimes they're just as fallible as any of us. Right. Yeah, and the, the mishaps and things like that in history or, you know, a bunch of guys in canoes up against boats, like the interesting stories are kind of why I enjoy playing historicals are those opportunities to put those stories on the tabletop with minis. Ah. So getting into that, uh, I recall talking to you on the side of watching this game that you were putting on uh, Perico. Mm -hmm. And didn't you say there was one of those mishaps in this, like towards the end of the battle or something where one of the ships did go up from powder magazine. Yes. Um, One of the ships was, so the captain was Don Francisco de Peralta, and he's one of the characters that they have always had in the game, and they recently released a miniature for him specifically. It was one of their event minis. Um, but in any case, uh, he had for a crew um, 77 African slaves that had been armed specifically for this fight. And it's one of those moments where you're kind of wondering like what, you know, did they really have a, a horse in this race at all to be on this ship? And I mean, getting, they were property being captured by the British and, and transported and resold would have been, you know, just as bad, if not worse than where they were already living under the Spanish. So he had 77 Africans aboard his ship. And they were putting up an incredible fight. Um, Peralta is the only captain who actually survived, and his ship was never successfully boarded throughout the battle. Um, However, towards the end of the battle, there were just so many people wounded on this ship, and you know the situation had deteriorated to the point that somebody must have slipped up and made a mistake like this somewhere. And they did catch the powder magazine of that ship. And that explosion actually ended the battle because he was the last, like really the last line of resistance um, before the powder magazine went up. And when it did go, um, Peralta himself actually dove overboard and was pulling these people out of the water and getting them also with the help of the privateers, getting them onto the canoes, getting them back onto the ship um, and just really trying to save as many as he could. Cause he was just that kind of commander. That's so cool. That's such a crazy story. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some things that you use for inspiration when you're designing stuff like this? Like oh. where do you find these stories? So these stories can come from um, 
I mean, primary sources are always the best, but one of the things that you run into with those is they're locked up in uh, government. You know, the French will have primary sources, but it's going to be in their national library and it's going to be in French or it's going to be in Spanish. Um, so one of the best ones that we actually have is the history of the Buccaneers of America, which was written about the voyage that the Battle of Perico was a part of. Um, and you can find that there, you can find that for free online. There are also, obviously, you can buy it in print, which is incredibly useful. Uh, and they have turned, so in terms of designing this scenario, this is actually one of the organized play scenarios that Firelock put out. Um, and they based that entire thing on this voyage as recorded in you know history of the buccaneers so if for, for the uninitiated just like let's explain what these organized play scenarios are like where people can find them when they're coming out stuff like that so their firelock wants people to play this game obviously um they're about as passionate about it as anybody would be about one of their kids so <laughs> They've been releasing these organized play scenarios in hopes that people will play them, report back, and it will just kind of drive more engagement with the game. The next wave of these will be coming out in January. If you have quartermasters in your area, the people who kind of go and demo and rep these games for you, uh, they should have access to those scenarios and be able to run those for you. Um, it's been some of them are I'm, available for free on the site, right? Uh, go, go ahead, Glenn. Go every, ahead. Every time they put them out, they should be. I was gonna say, I think the first three scenarios are available on the site, and I was looking into running them myself in this area. Unfortunately, I am running into the problem of being a newer quartermaster, and unlike Tyler, I haven't had the chance to collect every army yet. And these are very specific, involving a lot of the Spanish, which unfortunately my club seems to be a bit short on. So I'm trying to run them, but I'm probably going to be running them using some alternate forces, um, which would be my only comment on them to Firelock, which would be uh, if you're putting out a historical scenario, like a list of what the forces are that are on there is good, like what was actually there, but maybe have some alternate lists that people can play or say like, you know, it looks like it's 200 points of Spanish militia for one of them. So maybe just saying like, uh, you know, when we're when you're running this, if you're not running it with the exact forces listed, you want to have a defender that's a lot of militia, you know. So it could be 200 points. You just don't want 200 points of uh, elite French troops um, defending it because it's not going to be the same feel of the scenario. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Your sharpshooters. Um. Yeah. Yeah, and I can. I can agree with that. Um, and I think that's one of the pitfalls that you can kind of end up in with historical gaming is that you have to make that decision between do you want to present it exactly as it was where you're going to have to go out and, like I did, put together a whole bunch of models. And it's some of the stuff that I have is I am never going to use eight canoes in just like a friendly game with my buddies or taking it to a tournament and being like, yeah, all right, these are my natives in eight canoes. <laughs> uh, so I don't think that it's really fair to expect people to necessarily have the historical forces. And if people do want to run the organized play games with, you know, French militia, as opposed to Spanish militia, it's just deciding, you know, are you concerned about the balance and, and how the scenario is going to play because they are balanced. You probably could play these as tournament quality scenarios. Um, or do you want to go for that historical feel? And then how far down that rabbit hole do you really want to go? Well, I think to be clear, like, um, well, I do agree that there it's helpful to have some of the alternatives and stuff. Most of these don't have huge force lists, right? I mean, most of these are pretty small scale scenarios so they're pretty doable in terms of putting it together i want to say the land one i was looking at was like 200 points aside that one's huge yes 
But yeah, the other one was like a single ship against a single ship. Yeah, that's the one I was looking at when I first saw it. And And I I only have the flute. That's all I've got right now. So I've got to get some more ships put together. Or I I have to paint the flute, you know, and then then I can start thinking about buying another ship. Even with the Perico scenario that I ran, it's, I mean, it's, it's eight canoes and it actually, the recommendation is just several canoes, I think is the exact wording on it. Um, but it suggests, you know, for army scale, if you want to play it at the historical scale, that the three Spanish ships and then putting the privateers and two Paraguas and, several canoes but i think the actual scenario is written for one or two ships maybe i think only one spanish ship is what they're actually suggesting and then kind of like a very scaled down version of the battle like you'll get the feel and you'll get the flavor of what it was like to be going up against a full-size ship in a boat (laughs) but you're not gonna have to put out 100 plus miniatures on the board which is cool. I think that's what this game is about. Um, so for the sake of time, because um, I think we want to keep this to around 45, and I think we're getting there. Um, let's talk about upcoming events, um, what we're looking to get for Christmas. Um, you know, Let's give our lists to Santa in case Santa listens to the podcast. Um, so upcoming events, um, I'm probably helping run something down at Mythicos Games in Susquehanna, New Jersey. Uh, in late January, I'm probably going to be doing a painting class. I have to talk to Zach um, Metalla down there. Um, but mostly, I'm going to be over at Kerwin's Game Store and trying to do demos at uh, Gamer's Gambit after Christmas. So uh, I'm a teacher, so I have the whole week off. Um, so you guys can all you know, glower at me from afar, but um, I'm going to enjoy it to the fullest. So after the 20th, I am on vacation. And then I am off until after the new year. And then I go back to school. Um, So for that week, I'm going to be running demos, playing games. And the big thing that I'm doing that's a private event is I run something called NerdFest, um, which this year is going to fall on New Year's Eve. And I think we're going to have around 25 people at my house. And we play board games and rock band. And um, we played Secret Hitler, which I have to bring next uh, convention because Glenn said he wanted to play it. Um, oh, and, and my whole group does. Oh man, your group of friends would have so much fun with that. I'm sure you'd kill me at the first opportunity <laughs> because shoot to kill. <laughs> I am not a trustworthy person in that game. That's just I am. I'm a fink, uh, and I deserve whatever I get. So I'll, res- <laughs> I'll respect your assassination because I feel like that just shows you guys are smart. Um. So what am I hoping for for Christmas? I. I did buy $200 worth of battle foam um, for the Black Friday sale because I need to start storing some of these miniatures in something other than a shoebox because my collection is not Tyler Stone level or even Glenn level, but it's getting there. So I got myself a new bag um, and I got myself um, a place to put all the the metal that I've been painting so feverishly. So um, Glenn, what are you what are you up to and what are you hoping for for Christmas? Um, Well, I'm going to continue doing the demos at games and stuff on Monday nights for anybody that requests. And I have, we've gotten a few, like I said, we've gotten a few new people that way already, and we got more interested. Um, A other, another local store, GamerCore, in Ellicott City has contact or contacted me. Uh, We're also going to be running demos for them on January 18th. I don't have a solid time yet. We may be recording again before this. So, uh, if you're in the Maryland area and want to try Blood and Plunder because you're not sure about it, uh, GamerCore, Ellicott City, on 18th of January. I'm sure if you check their Facebook page, they'll be having details about that coming up. I'm sure we'll also be putting up events on the NDNG site um, because I think we're going to be trying to make sure everybody knows about that. So just follow NDNG on Facebook, and you'll get all the blurbs about what's going on um, as far as that, and for Christmas, unfortunately, uh, I think Santa's already come with the Black Friday sales. It got a little out of hand, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, lots of good deals, but uh, let's just say I've got a lot of painting ahead of me. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so Tyler, what do you have coming up? Um, <clears throat> so, oh, excuse me. Hold on here a minute. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, so what I'd like for Christmas... This is a long Christmas list that you're just clearing your throat to get ready to tell us, yeah? Oh, no, not at all. I was uh, would like to just shake the chest cold for Christmas. Um, no, so coming up, I think Glenn had talked about possibly doing a game down there at Games and Stuff, one of these big kind of historical games sometime in the new year. Yes, uh, I was looking to do a fleet battle, hopefully... Uh, possibly some kind of naval action where it might be more of a English or French, some, some kind of naval power going after buccaneers. So it probably would not be equal numbers of ships. The Navy would probably have some larger ships like frigates and corvettes versus mm-hmm. whatever buccaneers we can get together um, to have people bring their own stuff and put their own toys on the table. Um I'm looking for that, but I did ask Tyler to come down February 1st and host the Perico game that he ran at Fall In because it was such a big hit there. Cool. So I'm working on that, and I'm also looking forward in March, but I'm looking at uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to be doing for Cold Wars, if I'm going to be demoing some Firelock stuff there or if I'm going to kind of have the convention free to put something together of my own or just hang out and enjoy a convention. <laughs> uh, well, for, for cold wars, um, I know Mitch can't go cause he has to, he has to run a war game for the United States, uh, whatever <laughs> that is. Um, so Mitch is, <laughs> Mitch is busy. Uh, but, um, the Firelock guys, I think, are up for having us run another tournament at the HMGS thing. We had like, uh, we had twelve, we had twelve people, I think, this past one. So it's the biggest one we've had, and I think yeah. our numbers are going to keep going up because I got a bunch of friends that are buying armies and getting them painted up. So I, I think for Cold Wars, I'm probably going to be um, looking for help to run a tournament, um, and so I'll look to either Tyler or Glenn for that because I know Mitch is not going to be there, and uh, our bromance will have to pause. <laughs> um, you know, because I, I wrote him a, a love note on the way out because I snuck out in the morning. Um, I left Tyler and Mitch cold and alone in the hotel at Fall In. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to Cold Wars. I'm planning on running a tournament there for the Firelock guys. Um, and we want to do we want to mention some of the stuff that Firelock Games has coming out um, as we're looking sure. to wrap up. Well, for for first thing, uh, they've already released their beautiful sixth rate frigate. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a little bigger than the flute. Uh, it's definitely the largest warship that has been released. I don't count galleons as a warship; they're a treasure ship. <laughs> um, <laughs> although you know you probably don't want to fight one anyway. Um, but yeah, this thing looks amazing. I cannot wait to get my hands on one of them. And if anybody wants to get one, it will be the pride of your fleet. Definitely a great flagship to have if you're running a larger game. Yeah, they are gorgeous. And uh, they're the second ship that they've put out other than the Galleon that can run the heavy cannons. So that's an idea for how, how much of a monster you're going to put on the table if you pick one of those up. That's so cool. Um, and then on the topic of bigger ships, the other game that they're putting out is Oak and Iron, which is up for pre-order right now. Uh, and that should be coming out early in 2020. There have been will... some delays with it, but I think they're, they're getting there. They are getting there. Um, it's 1 600th scale, correct? 1 600? 1 600th what scale. I recall. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, like we mentioned earlier, probably a little bit better than trying to put a whole bunch of boats on one table. <laughs> uh, the last thing that we have on our list is is Blood and Valor. And Blood and Valor is the one skirmish version of Firelock games. And this thing is pretty cool. We've had No Dice, No Glory guys work on it. Mitch has worked on it. Um, 
he's got a pile of minis for this and it's it's great it's the same kind of elegant rule set you've got for you know the age of piracy and colonial warfare in the caribbean but they updated a bit and there's there's a bit of a you know a shine to the rules that fits the more modern aspect of the weapons involved so it, it's it's a cool game um I'm, we'll definitely talk about that as it gets closer to its release date um when we get a chance to meet up in january and uh yeah we'll, we'll give people our impressions and Tell them what we think once we have a chance to play. Yeah, I know. I'm excited about it. I definitely pre-ordered it as part of the Black Friday thing. And I've also pre-ordered a German force through Phalanx Consortium, who are the ones doing the official minis um, for Firelock. Those are good sculpts, too. They really are. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful. Although, I have to say, I am looking at the War Games Atlantic, I think it's called. Uh, they're looking to put out plastic World War One minis. And they're looking pretty sweet, too. Well, we'll have to do some comparisons. We'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. So I guess until next time, so it'll be this will be the last time we talk to people this year. And then we'll reconvene next year. We'll, we'll talk about what was left under the tree or what we're planning on buying because we didn't get it. And... Uh, and we'll chat up about what games we got going on. So I think we'll be able to record before you guys have your uh, your big demo game down by you, so you have a chance to kind of give it a, one less plug, see how many people you can grab for it. And if I can get something concrete nailed down with the store up here, I'll let people know, and I'll post on the website. Um, cool. Any last words or things people want to mention as we part? I've got nothing. All right. Uh, yeah, just... Swing by your local game store. Don't be afraid to go in and ask them um, if they know anybody in the area. If you don't, because you never know who else is around. I mean, I've been gaming at games and stuff for five, six years now. And still every other Monday, somebody's put in contact with me that is interested and has been playing for years and never bumped into us. So never be afraid to take whatever game you like playing and ask the local game store if there's groups, because they might know people you don't. All right, it's a good note to end on. So I'll part by saying happy holidays, Merry Christmas, um, and uh, if you find a pirate, trust them. They may surprise you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.